Good morning. How you doing? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good. Can Good. you hear me? Yes, I can. How about okay. that? Yeah, there are some uh, workmen in the house for something that's broken, so I'm going to go silent today. No. Oh, okay. I'll just talk to you by chat, okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Whatever works. Oh, okay. So you've been working on that some more? Yeah, until I have to turn it off, I'll turn it off. Yeah, this is my, um, I guess you call it a medley of uh, beach stuff. Right. My mother did one like this of watercolor and I copied hers. Oh. This is supposed to be sand dollars. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be um, seahorses, yeah. and now I'm going to do the last one is scallops. Oh, okay. All right. Because you, you submitted that once. And right. Really it. Yeah. But, yeah, it looks like you've done some more work on it. So. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I, I find that watercolor is terrific. Yeah. Some people really take to it, um, and other people really, <clears throat> really struggle with it. Um, a lot of people, you know, the first thing is, you know, oh, uh, watercolor is so hard. And I've never really found it to be terribly hard. It's just, uh, you know, you have to be, well, you have to have a plan. <laughs> right. Yeah. When you go <laughs> in. Always have, it always helps. <laughs> it does. It does a lot, you know. It's, it's not one of those things you can just kind of haphazardly go into because you know it's it's like you can't cover it up so it's like once it's no. there i know i know mm -hmm. <laughs> i definitely know so well i just find a lot of pleasure in painting and drawing and um doing something that i'm carrying on the tradition of my mom she she did a whole lot and uh, i never appreciated it actually she kind of hid it from all of us Mm -hmm. We didn't see it until after she was gone, so oh, okay. it's it's really cool the stuff that I found that she did, and um, so she's a good inspiration. Good, good. Hmm. I wonder where she hid it. Well, she hid it in a in a um, she hid it in a drawer, in a desk that's very uh, in an unlikely place in a part of the little alcove that we hadn't investigated after she left. And then we did, and there it was. And uh, it looks to me like she pla she painted for probably about four or five years and she got progressively better. And um, she painted some pictures of uh, our dogs and uh, airplanes because my dad was very, very interested in flying mm -hmm. and um, some, some other things like that. Oh, okay. Hi, John. Hey, hi, everybody. How you doing, I'll John? I'll have to leave shortly. I have a doctor's appointment this morning. Okay. All right. Well, Rebecca's going to be silent. She's got workmen. We never know about Naomi. 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 Right. <laughs> she will make herself heard if she needs to. That's, that's true. <laughs> I'm, glad you got, I'm glad you got your sound fixed there, uh, Rebecca. <laughs> It does make it so much more fun, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> uh -oh. well, you're, now you're on mute. You're on mute, Rebecca. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to mute because I need to stop. But thank you. Yes, I was on the wrong um, camera on my video camera. So I have a camera in the laptop itself. It does not work well. We added an additional one on top. And that one was not turned on, but wow. now it is. So it's all over now. I can talk. Watch out. All right. <laughs> so how are you doing, John? Oh, not too bad. I've got a routine doctor's appointment this morning, so okay. I'll be here about 20 minutes. That's it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, hmm. 
Well, you're going to miss a lot of fun stuff, actually. So. Uh, I must, yeah, I always, I, I, I always hate to miss these sessions. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about uh, actually several different artists uh, today. And uh, oh, I was going to start off with uh, Pete Mondrian. Uh, right. And actually, I think I will, since you're not going to be here but 20 minutes. Um, because a lot of people have a misconception about him. You know, thinking that, you know, he just did these, you know, rectangles and squares. But the fact is, mm, yeah, not so much. I mean, yes, he ended up doing that. But uh, that was not... That was not his his whole career by any means. Okay, so let me stop that. I guess uh, since you're only going to be here 20 minutes. Morning, Veronica. How you doing? She's on Good morning. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started since it is 10 o'clock. Okay. And um, we're going to we're going to take a look at Pete Mondrian. You know, the guy who did all the uh, squares, but uh, not really. You'll, you'll find that he didn't do all squares. So, so uh, we're going to take a look at him first. And uh, just kind of, I guess what I want you to look at is kind of what he started off doing and what he ended up doing. You know, so it's a good... example of how how people evolve not squares not squares no That squares or rectangles. Thank you. 
So as you can see, he didn't just paint square, did he? In a multitude of styles. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you think about the time that he lived and how art was evolving. And, you know, he, he kind of started off with kind of a post-impressionist style. Right. And moved into pointillism at some point. And right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he, he went through several different iterations. Right. Of, uh, his work, and he was trying different things. And, you know, in, in like a lot of the, a lot of the pieces that he did, and particularly like the studies, the quicker type things, um, you can begin to see, you know, in the pointillism, and also in those studies of the kind of the fruit trees that were kind of bare, how he began to break things down into shapes, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's like he started off, you know, with big masses of and blocks of color, and then he moves into smaller little pieces. And it's like all along the line, you know, he's beginning to break it down and simplify it and reduce it more and more until he just gets down to squares. Right. I wonder if anybody has ever viewed his paintings from way up above them to see the colors blend. <laughs> oh, you mean the, uh, the squares? Oh, the squares, right. Uh, um, you know, the, the thing about Mondrian, you know, he did those um, pieces and none of them are really all that large. You know, he, kind of, he tended to kind of work in like a medium size. And he didn't really get into this idea of doing his paintings the size of a wall. You know, so when you look at a Mondrian, sometimes, well, oftentimes when you look at him, you're kind of disappointed. You know, because, you know, they're hanging there on the wall and they're these fairly small paintings. You know, um, in in comparison to everything else around it, you know, in the museum, and um, but it, you know, but again, it it's I think it's more interesting to look at kind of how he evolved in his process, and and when you begin to kind of understand the steps that he went through and how he got to where he was then it begins to maybe make a little more sense for people. Right. I really, I really liked his flowers. I mean, they were just spectacular. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. They were beautiful. Um, and uh, in fact, we're going to look at another artist, um, Hopsev Pushman, who by any account is probably one of my very, very favorite artists now. You know, I can't say he's number one or number two or, you know, but I mean, I always find his work really, really inspiring. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to jump into that. Yes. Before we leave, do you pronounce his name Pete or Piet? Mondrian? Mondrian? Well, yeah, Pete. 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 Mondrian. So he Mondrian. was Dutch. That's why we saw all the windmills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And he was a, a big... In, Influencer of fashion at the time. Well, not at the time. No, no, with his blo blocks. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah, around like the 1950s, 1960s. Right. Yeah. 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 They started actually kind of reproducing some of his paintings on fabric. Right. You know, and I remember that. And also on furniture. You know, they, yeah, they, they made a lot of furniture and stuff with his, you know, kind of patterns and stuff as well. You know, not, not that he had anything to do, do with it. It was just sort of appropriated <laughs> as things. Yeah, Karen? Yeah, I, I missed 
kind of your opening there. And so I just started watching these and I thought, oh my God, these are all Mondrian. Mm -hmm. You know, I never would have guessed that, but he had so many different styles. I mean, his, his portraits I thought were beautiful, mm -hmm. Be beautiful. And his, but his, uh, and so were his, uh, many of his uh, landscapes. His landscapes, the colors were very muted, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? And I thought that was kind of interesting because obviously going from that muted tone, and it looked by the way, like he did, he was doing it in watercolor colors? He did both, he did watercolors and he did oils. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think he worked in a variety of medium. Um, uh -huh. Now his, the, the later work, the abstracts were done in oils. But uh -huh. That shows you really have to know how to paint before you can do abstract. Square, squares on a page. <laughs> I, have, I have to leave all, I'm sorry, but. All right. Thank you, sorry to miss the rest. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Um, and, to John's point, yeah, it's, uh, you know, one of the things that they tell young students all the time who are, you know, ready to jump into just doing big abstract pieces and stuff like that is that, you know, you need to learn the rules before you, before you start breaking them, you know, because if you know the rules, then you know when and how to break them. And it, uh, and it makes some sense. Um, and that's, that's definitely true uh, Mondrian. He went through this whole evolution uh, through his career and, uh, and did some beautiful work. You know, yeah. I, I tend to like his, his kind of earlier um, post-impressionist and pointillist type work more than, you know, I did his final uh, you know, abstract version, but but it's always like I said, it's always great to go back in and really look at an artist and look at a body of work and see kind of where they started and where they ended up at because there very few people you know who have a long career as an artist ever start off doing something and end up doing the same thing. You know, they they evolve. Um, and I, that's, you know, I think just a natural part of the process. So, uh, his, his squares, uh, you know, uh, when he got to that, I, it never occurred to me before, but how did he get those lines so straight? I, I mean, if I were doing that, I would be taping it off. Yeah. Was, was he, he able to tape? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had tape like, that, and how old was he when he got into that? Oh, uh, I think he was really quite a bit older. You know, I think he was probably in his 60s or 70s at that point. Uh huh. You know, because like I said, he, he had kind of lived through and survived several different art movements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it was like after World War II, you know, when he started doing those really severe hard edge, you know, type of uh, paintings. So oh, okay. probably- so, that, so then of course he, I thought it was, he was earlier than that. Um, but well, he, no, he, he was the late 1800s, I believe, you know, oh. when he was born. Um, I think he was like 1880, 1890, something like that. And then, uh, you know, and that would have been about the time that you were having what well, kind of the tail end of post-impressionism and then into pointillism and then into, I mean, abstraction generally didn't start until about 19, about 1915, though almost was like 1901, but you know, Nobody ever saw her stuff until, you know, well, really the 1970s or 1980s is when they kind of discovered her, so.
Okay, here I just pulled it up. He was born in 1872. Yeah, and then died uh, 1944 in New York. Oh, okay. So Obviously he, born in the Netherlands, but mm -hmm. ended up in New York. Right. Well, I think he was Jewish, and I think he, I think he, he probably immigrated to the U.S. somewhere, like you know, like maybe right after World War One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was there was a lot of a lot of Jewish people came. You know, after World War One. You know, they started kind of coming into the East Coast in New York, but then there was a big mass migration within the first, well, really the a couple of years before World War II broke out. Uh, you know, and and a lot of them came to the United States. So. Charles, I was I was looking up uh, one of his most famous works is called. Broadway Boogie Woogie, mm -hmm. and it's his pictorial vocabulary of lines, squares, and primary colors, culminating his stylistic innovation, and is one of the most influential artworks in the school of abstract geometric painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was Mondrian who, he really influenced uh, what you would call the uh, hard edge school and uh, that was that that the heyday of that was really in the mid 1960s when uh, a lot of abstract artists were you know taping these you know lines down and you know putting kind of flat broad colors um, you know down next to each other and uh, so yeah, he was a he was a huge influence on that whole idea or that whole movement. So anyhow, um, let's let's move on. All right. Um, now let's go. Back before that. Okay, how so?
So that was uh, Hopsev Pushman. Yeah. Now Hopsev lived to be 99. Here, hang on. That's not. Let me get back to. Well, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so like I said, he, he lived to be uh, 99 years old, had a good long life. And um, he's probably, like I said, he's, he's probably one of my very favorite artists. Um, that was a small, <laughs> a very, very small sampling of his work. Um, they have, uh, well, they have kind of uh, reviews of his work that go on for almost an hour like that and uh, literally probably like 14 1500 paintings and he did wow. yeah he did like figurative work uh did a lot of still lives um but the thing i really love about his work is he really knew how to use color and how he played you know, and, and balance just a little bit of intense color against these really kind of muted, neutral backgrounds. And uh, when I say muted and neutral, that doesn't mean that they were all gray. They were just very subdued color, you know, even like yellows and oranges and things. He, he had a way of neutralizing them and pushing them back and then putting this really bright, intense color in the painting somewhere that would really pop and uh you know all of his all of his paintings they're they're very very well thought out you know they're not haphazard and uh and they're very carefully done so yeah. like i had never heard of them before i i was not familiar with them at all but his stuff is beautiful. Uh, obviously, he was intrigued with the Chinese. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, his, uh, they categorize him as an Orientalist. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and he did, uh, he traveled throughout the Far East and uh, North Africa areas like that and and that influenced uh his subject matter and painting um but eventually he left europe and moved to america and uh i think he spent like at least 30 or 40 years you know in in the u.s uh his last name please pushman yeah p-u-s-h-m-a-n <clears throat> M -A -M. Again, his, his uh, portraits are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, he did some really, really beautiful figure work and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And you wouldn't really categorize him as an academic painter. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, quite so tight and meticulous um as like an academic painter would be but at the same time you know his his stuff was really solid well drawn um 
But for me, it's just the way he used paint. He was just a, you know, when I, when I look at his work and then I look at somebody like Norman Rockwell, you know, their color palettes were really different, but they used paint a lot the same way. You know, it was, it was loose, but it was accurate at the same time and uh, really beautifully done stuff. So just real rich, nice surfaces, you know, to play with. So uh, anybody else got any, anything to say about Hopsa before we move on? Can I assume he had a formal uh, training? Or, or yes, I just read up on him. He had a lot of training, a tremendous amount of training. And Charles, I see his influence in all of your work. It's a remarkable because you like the Chinese motifs and mm -hmm. your, your use of color reminds me very much of how Mr. Pushman does. Yeah, I've looked at a lot of his work and uh, you can, you know, you can learn a lot by just, you know, looking at how he did things. And, uh, you know, I really do admire his work a lot. So, um, all right. So now I'm going to throw you guys a curveball. <laughs> and. Da, da, da. All right, we, we did Mondrian. So uh, here's a technique thing, okay? And it's, uh, have you tried using acrylic paint with soft pastels? Oh. <clears throat> Welcome to Monet Cafe. I'm artist Susan Jenkins, bringing you a lesson that I think is going to be enlightening I am combining in this video tutorial two mediums, you wouldn't think you could combine, acrylic paint and soft pastel, which can produce beautiful results. If you would, go ahead and like this video, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already, and if you hit the little bell next to the subscribe button, you'll be notified of any future videos I post. This free video tutorial is brought to you because of the faithful support from my patrons on my Patreon page. For $5 a month, you can support this channel and you get extra content. Hello artists and welcome to Monet Cafe. I'm artist Susan Jenkins, bringing you a lesson that I think you're going to love. Oh, and I'm wearing the brand new Monet Cafe apron, artist apron. It has the new Monet Cafe logo on it. These aprons are great. They're offered by a company called Zazzle. The quality is awesome. They're washable. The logo doesn't fade. And they have these three deep pockets to put your stuff in. And, oh, I do have shorts on under this. It also has a tie in the back and an adjustable strap. So you can adjust it. Anyway, I love mine. I almost hate to it. But it's time to get started. Now, I haven't finished this painting yet, but you're gonna see from the beginning a lesson on how to combine acrylic paint and soft pastel. I was actually reminded of this technique from an older video of mine. Sometimes I see my past videos and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> so I think you're going to enjoy it. You're going to learn a lot. You can recreate from this tutorial or use these techniques to create your own work. All right, guys, let's get started. And I think you're going to learn a lot. Here we go. The surface I'll be using is an acrylic pad made by Arteza. I really love these sheets that are, they have a little bit of thickness to them, they have a little texture to them, and the sheets are 11 by 14 in size, and I love them to do all kinds of multimedia work, but they really work great for applying acrylic paint, of course it's an acrylic pad, and I'll tell you my technique and trick for adding soft pastel. The reference photo is one of my own. It's some peonies, a flower that I really love. I took it from a flower market and I just had to paint it. And if you're a patron of mine, you will get a copy, a downloadable file of this reference image. And I also will have all of these products, product links in the description of this video. And before we get started, I thought I might have a shot of tequila. No, I'm totally kidding. I don't even drink liquor. <laughs> but I think someone gave this box to my husband as a gift or something. I thought it was a great box to hold my um, 
acrylic paints and I have not used these in so long. I found that some of them were drying up. So I need to use this technique more often of combining acrylic paint and soft pastel. Now I have my surface taped down. And whenever I use acrylic or oil paint, I love using this Gray Matters paper palette made by Jack Richeson. And it's really nice that the surface is gray and on the back, there's some great information. He even describes why he uses a toned or gray palette surface. It has a value scale, some great color theory information. And uh, this is just truly a really great way to have a palette for acrylic paint or oil paint. I used a pretty limited palette with my acrylic paints. I love to mix colors when I'm painting with mediums that are wet medium. And I got a couple of blues and yellows. I did get, I like to mix my own greens, but I used a couple of greens as well. Now I'll include a list of my colors in the description of this video as well. I used a piece of willow charcoal, uh, willow or vine charcoal. They're just sticks of charcoal. And I find they're great to sketch with. And I'm gonna let you know that this video, it took me a few hours to create this painting. So I will be providing the tutorial in segments um, to make the video so it's not so long and speeding up a few sections. I think you'll still learn a lot though. Before my sketch, I didn't bother to laboriously put up a grid system or anything. I like to just freehand it and uh, make, I wanted these to be really impressionistic and loose anyway. And it's like I say to you guys a lot, sketch a lot. It really does get better the more that you practice. And now it's time to get started with acrylic painting. Oh, I love to begin with a cup of coffee. You know, this is Monet Cafe. And I do have a Monet Cafe coffee cup and t-shirts. It's underneath every video. So check that out if you'd like to. I'll talk a little bit more about my color selection as I'm painting, but here are the two blues, ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, Indian yellow, and an azo yellow, and alizarin crimson, and a permanent magenta. That's a green gold and a titanium white. You will of course need some water for acrylic paint and a brush. I'm using a, just kind of a wide standard, very cheap brush, and I'm gonna use the same wide brush the entire time. And of course you need some paper towels as well. Here I'm mixing up the two blues to see how it creates a, an interesting color. What I'm doing though is I'm creating a dark. So I combined a couple of the blues, some of that alizarin crimson, and a little bit of the green to neutralize it. Because if I just did the blue and the red, what are you going to get? Purple, right? Well, I wanted like a dark, dark green. So I added just a touch of the azo green and a little teeny touch of the azo yellow. I just put a little bit on my brush to mix in. You see how really a, an ultramarine blue, a alizarin crimson, and a green makes an excellent dark. So uh, this was kind of getting me the shade that I wanted. I wanted it a little cooler as well. So now I'm just going to add a little bit more water to it and I'm ready to paint. And if you are not an experienced acrylic painter, and I don't claim to be an experienced one, I really like acrylic artwork and I've done quite a bit of it, I would say, not nearly as much as pastel, but it does take you a little bit to get familiar with the water to paint ratio. This is very similar to working with watercolor as well. So it's like any medium, you just have to do it a, you know, a little bit. I added some white to the greens, you can see, to lighten up some areas. And really my strategy is similar to soft pastel painting and, and other mediums as well, which is to get in your big shapes. I'm saying that all the time when I'm beginning a painting. I am literally looking at the shapes. I And with acrylic painting, you can also work similarly to soft pastel painting and oil painting. You can work dark to light. In other words, I know that I can add light on top of dark, but I also know I'm gonna be adding soft pastel to this. So really, I ended up doing probably more to this than I needed to, um, to create an underpainting. Keep that in mind, this is an underpainting. And I was having so much fun though, I was getting a little bit more detailed than I needed, but uh, it was fun. I hadn't painted in acrylic paint in a while. You can see I've mixed my own purples. Remember, I didn't have any purple on my palette. I'm adding white when I need to lighten something up. Now I'm gonna get to some of these pinks. And I wanted a warm pink, so you can see I mixed in a little bit of my red and pink and added a little yellow that uh, gave me kind of this, uh, I don't know, just a really nice peachy kind of warm pink and a little bit more of a pink, like a rosy type of color. 
Now this foreground flower is going to be my, one of my main focal points. And I kind of imagined it like a, almost like an S-shaped curve going up from there, leading the viewer's eye in. That flower there will be one of the next um, supporting character focal points. And so I'm keeping those things in mind and more specifically when I start to uh, apply the soft pastel, making sure to give more uh, color and detail to areas where I want my viewer's eye to go. So these are incredibly loose. I'm really, see I use the same brush this entire painting and I just kind of turn the edges um, to give the idea of petals. And I know I'm speeding this up so I can get to the soft pastel portion, but I think I spent probably 35 to 45 minutes on this. I don't think you need to if you decide to do an acrylic painting as an underpainting. You can really keep it even more simple than I did. Um, but again, I just love mixing colors. It was really um, nice, a nice departure. And when I first started, I wasn't sure if I was going to add the little tag that's at the bottom that has the name Peonies Flowers on it. Uh, but I decided it actually made an interesting focal point from it. Now it is in shadow, so that's why I added kind of the purple and uh, a lot of other colors on that tag. It all comes together when I add the pastel. And as I often say, even with my soft pastel tutorials, it's a good idea to work the whole, don't get too caught up on any one area and realize that the painting is a whole, it's a whole uh, visual experience. And if we focus too much on one area, usually you can make it where it's not as consistent with the rest of the painting. I did decide to add some blues to cool it off underneath that table and um, lighten up those little, uh, looks like baby's breath. I know they're not really white because they're kind of in shadow, so I gave it kind of a cool greens, like little leaves in there and um, kept things a little bit more gray. So this will all develop more when I add pastel. So if you give this a try with acrylic, keep it loose, even looser than I've done here. Um, and very impressionistic. This is an underpainting. I've zoomed in enough here where you can even see the texture to this acrylic paper. And now how am I going to add pastel to this acrylic painting? Well, you can't just add pastel on top. It's not going to hold, you're not gonna get any layers. So I'm now protecting my black board that I made. By the way, see that video? I do. I make that board. And I'm going to use this clear gesso. It's got texture. That's why I was doing my fingers like that. Little bits of sand to it. Uh, you could also use, there are other products to give texture. One is called Golden Pastel Ground. I like it too. Another one is Golden Fine Pumice Gel. I've opened the jar. It's also got a little sandy texture. Now I like a, a big wide brush is a good idea for this. And I used to put it in a dish. Now I just put it right on it and I just brush it in. And the reason that I usually go with the clear gesso is that it's more affordable and it works great. So that was just one coat. I use a blow dryer. You can see how it dries more clear after you dry it a little bit. And now I am ready for pastels. Okay, what pastels am I going to use? This set is called the Sennelier. Um, it's a wonderful company in France, and it is the Paris collection. I love this set because it's so beautiful. It, the quality of the pastels are amazing, and it's so affordable. These are 120 half sticks. It's not the full stick. I love the half sticks because, first of all, they don't come with labels. That's a pet peeve of mine. I don't like taking off labels. Second, this little size or smaller size, it's not really little, is better to paint with than a long stick. I usually break my pastels anyway. So I'm going to use primarily this Paris collection of pastels, and I'm going to show you a few other um, pastels I use from another set. But the other great thing is it's so affordable. It's on Amazon typically for around $130. I think I saw it for around $120 recently, and that's like a dollar pastel. Mm -hmm. That's a half stick, but still, that's an amazing price for such a quality pastel. Mm -hmm. As you can see, this set has vibrant colors. I will have a link to this set in the description of this video so you can find it on Amazon. I have had so many people buy this set after I recommend it because it really is outstanding for the quality and the colors and the price. When I'm working with one set, I usually just try to lift out a few colors I think I might use for the painting. And then if you're a patron of mine, I'm gonna to try to show a final shot of most of the colors I used. Now, I did get another set. This is the Schmincke 
120 half stick set. Oh, I like that color. And they had some reds in there that was so pretty. They're, the flowers, the peony flowers are pinkish red. Some lean a little cooler, some lean a little warmer. Now, unfortunately, they don't have that Schmincke set available anymore, but you can find some of those sets on dakotapastel.com. All right, I'm ready to get started. I've got my painting on my easel. So many people ask, how do you put your iPad on your easel? It's sticking up there. Well, this is just a cover I got from Walmart. I flip it over and I hang it over the back. It's not magic. It looks like magic. I mean, that's one of the most common questions I get is, how is your iPad sticking up there? So super easy. All right, now I'm beginning with pastels. My texture on this is wonderful. It's just enough texture from that clear gesso for the pastels to apply beautifully. I want to keep this very impressionistic. I'm not going for realism with this. I want these flowers to feel free and artistic. And so I'm keeping a very light touch. Now that's a good idea as a general rule of thumb. Even if you're working realistic, you start out with a really light touch. And with clear gesso, you're able to get quite a few layers. And with pastel painting, well, a lot of paintings really, that's one of the strategies, is not to try to just match color and put the right color in all the right places because the colors will end up looking kind of like a paint by number. Instead, we're layering color. That's what happens in nature. You're getting all kinds of colors influencing other colors and they're layered upon each other. So, and they start to vibrate and interact with each other. So I'm going in now with a cooler, more neutral, kind of a lavender pink color. And I want to keep these roses in the back. They're further away. And one strategy with focal point is if things are far away, they're not the star of the show, I'm going to keep them softer, less detail, less bold color, and maybe a little bit more neutral, not so bright in the distance. So, and I'm working, um, because I'm left-handed, sometimes I will work from the top left corner. Now I do still work the whole painting and I'll come back to it, but I just developed a habit of um, sometimes starting in the left corner. And so you can see I'm just adding little um, strokes to give the impression of roses. Now this is right now, this is real time, but I'm gonna speed this up and uh, work more on the painting. I'm already at about um, 15 minutes into it. And I want you guys to get to see more of the full uh, progress of this painting. And while if you look at the reference image, you may see, oh, pink, pink everywhere. There is quite a bit of influences of some warmer tones as well, leaning a little bit more towards peachy and even some reds. I would say there are cooler reds. What I have in my hand actually is a little bit of a cooler red. And, but they do get a little bit warmer in some of the darker areas. So I just basically continue to layer. Now I'm layering a little bit of light. If you look at the reference image on top of the peony flowers, um, there is a little bit of light kind of catching. You can see somewhat where the light is in these by looking at the highlights. I see on the tag, there's some light kind of filtering from above. Now this was in a, uh, it's a grocery store actually called the Fresh Market. I don't know if they're nationwide in America, but um, usually in grocery stores, the lighting is going to be from above. And you can see it catching on some of the petals. Now, sometimes the petals are lighter just due to that particular species. So it might not always be the light that you're seeing, but um, keep that in mind too. And know that the shadows are going to be deeper down and, um, and, and they're pretty easy to see in this one. If you squint your eyes, you can see the darkest dark uh, is pretty much really under the table of course but underneath that large flower to the right and almost center and that is going to be a good focal point strategy i think that's why i like this photo so much it just naturally had a good composition to it and the reason that's a good focal point of course the entry flower those little baby's breath in the tag gently pulling your eye in not too much detail though you never want too much detail around the edges you'll see me develop that later but that main flower, bringing the viewer in uh, real gently towards that flower I was speaking of with the shadow underneath. What really makes a focal point uh, grabbing is contrast. Light next to dark. Our eyes just naturally go to that. 
So you'll see me later develop that shadow under that flower and it really does create a nice focal point and a little bit more darks into the center. So I'm adding some of those shadows, some of those darks now. I'm using from the Sennelier Paris collection, one of the greens, one of those greens, that collection has a lot of nice darks, but one of the greens is just such a nice dark. It, it appears almost black when you see it on film, but it's really just a super dark green. Now I'm adding this beautiful blue that's in that set. Now, if you notice, I kept, when I moved my hand out there, I kept a lo little bit of light, tealish blue behind those background flowers. And the reason is, I don't know if you can see it in the reference image, but it had one of those plastic cellophane type of wraps around the flowers and down around some of those, it looks like at the bottom right corner, there's some like leaves coming out. Those also were something they were selling. It had a little tag on it as well that had some of that cellophane around it. Uh, cellophane around it. So you're gonna see me later um, kind of give some um, more detail to that, especially in the lower area there. And I'll talk you through how to do it. But basically you saw up top, uh, what I did, I knew the cellophane, it's almost like uh, how do you paint a glass jar with flowers in it? Um, kind of can mess up your brain a little bit. But basically I squinted my eyes when I was doing the acrylic portion I did some dark and I left some light where I knew that cellophane would be. Um, not too light though, because it's pretty dark. And then I knew I could layer color on top, just glazing it. Almost like we glaze over water. If any of you guys have seen some of my tutorials on painting water, giving that illusion of flatness, you literally just glaze over it. So that's what I did with that cellophane. I also gave a little bit of influence of the red flowers highlighting. Um, onto the cellophane, light, or reflecting, I should say. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I'll, I'll go back later and even show more of that section and the foreground part with the cellophane as well. Now you can see I've just been um, gradually layering. It's all kind of the same process with these flowers. And this portion, I'm sorry, I did, um, I think I moved my camera further back and my head got in the way and my crazy hair, I think this was one morning when I I had quit working on it um, one day and got up the next morning. And these are just one of those things you have to remember when you've been making videos forever and occasionally you forget. I just kind of wanted to paint, I guess. I didn't pull my hair back. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, it's the same kind of process, just gradually um, developing these flowers, almost from the inside to the outside. That's the way I think of it. Inside these flowers, it would be rather dark. And as, the, as they, have more petals on the outside, you get more of the light reflecting them and you start adding the lighter values. Now I'm using that really pretty, it's kind of a bluish purple, to just kind of highlight some of that plasticky material and um, I'm giving a little indication of maybe it coming around the other side, even though I didn't see it very well, I sort of imagined it. And now you can kind of see how they're sort of wrapped in that and it's so delicate and um, so you want to keep it light strokes and very delicate. Now you can see it a little bit better. And now here's an example of what I was saying. I'm taking this pastel, I'm turning it on its side, I'm just lightly glazing, and it kind of looks like some of the light is hitting it. And keep in mind the direction of where the light looks like, how, how it's moving in a directional line, and that'll make it more believable as well. Now this is another green, it's dark, not as dark as the other one, I, I really like this green. It's very subtle and neutral. And for some of these leaves that I didn't want to be the focal point, I didn't want them too bright. Now, uh, and, and here's another neutral green. Isn't that pretty? I do think I warm some of these up a bit later. Uh, I kind of wish I'd have left them this neutral. And now I'm just carving in some of the negative shapes. And I think often, I know I did this as beginning artists, we feel like we have to create the shape to be the way it is with our first initial strokes. And that's not the most painterly way to paint. We can literally just glaze in rather loosely the shapes using values and then later come back in and carve out that shape with some um, negative painting, rather like doing, uh, much like doing sky holes. Um, now you saw I added a little bit of yellow to one of the center flowers. I added just a hint of dark, now a little bit dark in this center. This is one of the focal points. And that dark is so nice for these flowers. It's a dark burgundy. Now that one in my hand, I can tell is not from the 
the set. It did have a nice dark uh, that was kind of a burgundy, dark brownish burgundy, but it wasn't quite this dark. This is That one was from the Terry Ludwig dark collection. I think it was the, they have two sets of darks. If you haven't tried Terry Ludwig pastels, they're amazing and they're made in the United States. The people there are awesome. Customer service is great. And um, they have such a wonderful set of darks. It's called Terry Ludwig Darks 1 and Darks 2. I believe it's 30 pastels in each set. And um, they're not cheap. But if you need some good darks, you can even go online and look at their dark set. And it will show you, I think it's on the Terry Ludwig website, it'll show you the color numbers for each color in the set. I do recommend the one called Eggplant. I think it's called V100. I use that one all the time. It's a dark, dark purple. It looks almost black, but it's a great um, dark. If you had to pick one, it's probably a good one. Uh, and you can always tone them down by layering it. It's too dark. And you can see I'm just developing this center poppy. Uh, in hindsight, I always say this with my videos because I get the benefit of being able to see um, the beginning stages and know what the final looks like. So a lot of times I'm teaching myself while re-watching re these, but as I say often, there were some of the beginning stages that were so nice and loose. I almost wish I had just ever so subtly layered pastel. There's my head in the way again. Um, but I was very happy overall, but I'm always learning. Um, now this flower is starting to develop a little bit more. Do you see how I developed it? Not, I didn't worry about whether or not I got a little bit of that darker pink. In the way of where I would put the light, I just layer it and then build those layers. I, oh. I, this flower had a little bit more vibrance of color. I didn't want to get it too punchy. Why would you think? Why would this flower not want to just pizzazz and give a lot of detail? Well, it's because it's close to the edge and it's not my focus. You don't want to pull the viewer's eye right out of the painting. So I got into the other drawer. Lower left, up to that main peak. I don't know if I keep saying roses and poppies. <laughs> poppies begins with P, maybe that's why. But um, gently pull the eye up to that focal point, uh, peony flower, and curve it around and out to those poppies at the upper left. So that's my goal. And so you want to be careful not to get too much detail everywhere. So I am, you know, jumping around, sometimes slowing this down, and then sometimes speeding things up in areas that's kind of more of the same. But I wanted to not speak with the paper. shadow underneath and it does have a bit of that it's holding those greenery so i'm trying to be a little careful with that now i'm working right on top of the acrylic with the clear gesso but i wanted to warm up that table it was really a metal table but i wanted to maybe make it feel a little bit like old planks of wood so I did a little bit of gray and a little bit of a, a warmer gray to it. It did have an edge to it. Um, I don't want it to be too awfully bold or straight. I like broken edges. They look more painterly. If I had a super straight edge there, uh, I mean, you don't want it to be, you know, not level. <laughs> but if I had a super sharp edge there, um, it would also distract from my focal point. So just a little bit of subtlety to give the viewer the indication that it is an edge, it's a straight edge, but um, just very subtle and gentle. Now I'm developing, I'm working from the inside out again, much like with the flowers, um, keeping values in mind, but I know I've got some greenery coming out of that um, cellophane, and then later I'll go back and layer the, the plastic sheen on top of it, adding a little bit more warmth to some of these. And I really do, kind of zone out even when I was doing the acrylic painting part I, I get my sketch in I even kind of zone out with sketches I don't think about the fact that they're flowers I'm just thinking these are shapes and looking at the spatial relationship between these shapes looking at the edges and um, how things relate to one another and then when I start painting I kind of do the same thing if I start thinking too much about all these flower petals it's going to get bit too detailed too quickly. Um, so I don't know why, I, I guess I accidentally zoomed out for this section here. And once again, probably I think I had gotten up in the morning and I had I have a treadmill in my house. I never leave home, guys. <laughs> I am uh, at my home studio like all the time. My husband's building us a home that we've been trying to build uh, since our house flooded in 2017. We're living in a temporary living situation. 
My studio is in a 10 by 13 room. I've always had a little teeny studio. Monet Cafe was born of me just being like you guys, trying to figure out how to paint with pastels. And so that's what I've been doing the whole time. Um, so now I'm, I'm kind of redeveloping that shape. See, I didn't even have my shape exactly right with the acrylic part, but that's how versatile things are. You want to get it basically right, but you still have a little bit of wiggle room to correct things. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so I was getting my little story about Monet Cafe. One day I might have to just make a little a history testimonial kind of thing about um, Monet Cafe and its, uh, its beautiful little history. It's dramatic history, I should say. Oh, but I know what I was saying. My husband is building our home. We had purchased after we sold our home that flooded. Praise the Lord. I was like, how is anybody going to buy this house that totally flooded due to Hurricane Irma? But due to the Lord's blessings, um, we got it renovated. We were living in a travel trailer. My husband and my two large boys that were going to college. And um, we made it through and um, sold that house. And we bought a piece of land. And it was our dream to build a home on that. It had a little tiny home on it. And uh, in the meantime, we renovated another property that we had, which is the one we're living in right now. It was an old, old house. We call it Granny's house now. We bought it from a 90 five-year-old woman. I think she was 95 at the time. And uh, she actually got higher offers on the house um, than the one we offered. Well, trust me, we got it for a steal. Um, but she loved the fact that my husband was a believer and she was too. And he gave, he, he made an offer that was a number that had some sevens in it. Um, and, and these are not upper sevens, just so you know. It was, um, an, and sevens is a number of the Lord, you know. And she accepted our offer over other higher offers. Now, what was that the Lord or what? So that house that we bought didn't intend on being a house we would live in. It was before our property flooded, but it ended up being the house we're living in now after we got it renovated. Oh, and trust me, that could have been one of those home show things because you're always like, oh, we'll just renovate these cabinets and this floor. We'll add some vinyl floor. And you run into all these problems. It was, it was basically totally gutted and redone while we lived in our travel trailer. Anyway, oh my gosh, was that a long tangent. <laughs> but now you can see that I have developed that one area over to the right. Can you tell it looks like the little uh, white tag is underneath the plastic? The reason is because I kept it cooler and a little bit darker value than even the white that's in the reference image. And if I'd have had that very white white, um, and I also glazed a little bit of that blue over it, um, but if it had been very white, it would have looked like it was sticking on top and not like it's underneath those flowers. So now I'm going in and I'm kind of redeveloping this main flower. And I'm just going to, and I'm using a white charcoal pencil. It's not even a pastel pencil. It's a charcoal pencil. And I had, when I did the acrylic portion, again, I didn't worry about a lot of petals. I just kind of got in shapes and values and colors. And I knew I kind of needed to reshape it. My strategy was to give it a little more detail as to lead the eye in. Um, but one of the things that already inherently had going for it with respect to focal point is the um, fact that it's lighter. Remember I said light next to dark or even just color different from other things draws your eye to it. So it kind of okay. naturally had a focal point strategy. Oh, and another focal point strategy it has, it's larger than the other flowers. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen it, you, might like to watch my video. I think it's called Five Focal Point Strategies, something like that. And it, it was really an education myself. I was researching focal point. And whenever I learned something new, I love to share it with you guys. So I ended up making a video out of it. And from that lesson I created, I have remembered those focal point strategies so well. And um, hmm, that is definitely one of them. Something large, um, something high contrast, something detailed. So check that one out. Now I'm just developing this little tag underneath. Same strategy as the other tag. I don't want to give it too much detail. I don't want it to be so detailed that it looks unnatural and I want it to be subtle. But I know that some of these, the tag is underneath this flower. Those little baby's breath flowers are underneath the, the main peony flower. And um, they're, uh, they have some uh, little bits of green uh, which get cooler as they go under the shadow. That's what happens with color temperature. I also know I'm doing the same thing as keep preaching, layering. I'm not doing, notice I'm not doing white baby's breath immediately. They're cooler, they're in the shadow. 
Some of them are a little lighter, but I'm doing it gradually. Remember, layering. Think of going from the inside out or from the bottom to the top. And I'm just using some grays rather than whites because uh, they're a little darker in value. Mm -hmm. And um, a variation of some colors and keeping it really impressionistic. Gradually, I'm working to get a little bit lighter. And um, then I'll just eventually give just a few that are light. Now, I also want this, I, I debated, I was like, I, I got to put the name on this tag. I thought, should I put the name? It has to have it because otherwise it's like it's just a big white square. So I thought, okay, I've got to put the word or the letters. It was actually in the reference image of, here I go, peonies on the tag. I used a charcoal pencil and I had to keep in mind the angle and whether or not my little uh, letters were going to center correctly or fit right. And I wrote the word sale on the other one. Now to make it look like it was under the flowers, I just added a few little flowers that were just barely on top of it. You wanted to still read the, the letters, but uh, have some of those baby breath flowers on top of it. So I think it came out as believable. And now I'm just signing it. And I've just talked away. Look at me. I've talked through this entire 34. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. That I really love this combining of acrylic paint and soft pastel. I had forgotten that I used to even do that. I hope you will too. Please comment in this video. All right. Whoosh. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Whoosh. Right. What a boatload of information. <laughs> I feel like I'm drowning. Yeah. I, I just want to know who was snoring there. Oh. Somebody <laughs> fell asleep. I know. <laughs> I can't really blame them, can you? All right. Well, at any rate. Um, okay. So what did you guys think of her? You know, other than she talked a lot. She was terrific. She covered, yeah. she covered, she covered the waterfront yeah yeah um you know i i've used techniques like that in the past um when i was doing illustration work uh not so much with pastels but with using acrylic paint as a base and then working over it with prismacolor pencil mm. you know to bring up you know sharper edges more contrast and you know subtle gradations you know change uh, temperatures, you know, in certain areas, things like that. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty effective technique, um, you know, either way, but let's see. Well, it, I learned how to, um, paint with acrylic and with pastels and you need to seal the acrylic with the gesso before you put the pastels over it. Well, yeah. That was surprising to me. I, uh, you know, I thought, oh my God, what is she doing to that painting? You know, right. but uh, yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Well, that clear gesso, as she pointed out, when, when you get that stuff, it kind of comes with a little bit of pumice in it. So it's, it's got like a bit of a tooth to it. Um, and so if you're going to be working pastel over the surface, that's the advantage of doing that. Now, when I was doing Prismacolor pencil over the acrylic, I never, I never did that. You know, I just worked directly right on top of the acrylic. Um, because, you know, you, you don't really need a gritty surface, you know, if you're doing Prismacolor on it. Uh, but with the pastel, yeah, it, it certainly does help. Um, okay. Anybody got any other comments, questions, or anything else before we? You know, I didn't, I, I couldn't see the, the plastic in I, I the could, original. It was faint. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the wrapping stuff around? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was faint. The, yeah. um, the, um, picture that she used as her prop was not very well lit. No, no, it was, uh, well, really about the only, only lit area on there was that really that first, you know, flower and everything else was falling back into shadow, you know, all the rest of the flowers and things like that. So, um, yeah, it, it was real subtle and I don't, 
you know, she didn't really go in there and she didn't really bring it out uh, to be, you know, really readable. It was something that she kind of kept in the background. And uh, I think if I were going to do that, you know, I would, I would probably push, you know, the values in the background a little more than she did, but that's just me. So. Mm -hmm. So would you use a fixative or something to coat this afterwards since the pastels are on there? Uh, you can. Um, you know, normally with a piece like that, you would put it under a piece of glass with a spacer. Um, and if you're going to fix it at all, you want to do it really lightly. Uh, because one of the problems with trying to put a fixative on top of pastel is that all the all the lights will sink back when you do that um a lot of people who work with pastel what they'll do is they'll they'll get in their darks and then they'll, they'll do a a light coat of fixative over it you know to you know tack them down and then they'll work their mid-tones and do the same thing right but again, even more lightly than they did with the dark. And a lot of times, you know, the final layers, you know, the brighter lights, they, they don't fix those. You know, they'll just leave them, you know, sitting on the surface. But then again, you, you've got to put it under glass. Yeah. Otherwise, you know. Yeah, somebody sneezes on it. And <laughs> there it goes. It all goes away. So yeah. in a cloud of dust. Yes, in a cloud of dust. There you go. So all right. Uh, okay. Hey Richard, how you doing? Good here. Good. It's good to see you. Good to be seen. Yes, we haven't seen you for a while now. Well. So they just keep Yeah, they're keeping you busy? Keep me busy on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry about that. All right. Um, anybody got any anything else we need to cover real quick before we move on? Any questions? Are you ending the class now? No, no, no. Uh -oh. No, we got more. <laughs> no. I'm no. sorry, I missed it, but I didn't get all of it. Oh, uh, uh, you mean the uh, the last video? Jean? Yes, yeah. I did. I just came in when she was uh, telling <clears throat> that she's painting pastels over the acrylic painting mm. she had done. I didn't see anything previous to that. I just got back to the room. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, she's on YouTube, and you can you can look her up. It's uh, Have you tried using acrylic paint with soft pastels? And it's uh, Susan Jenkins is her. Her name. All right. Do you, know where, do you know where in Florida she lives? No, I don't. Yeah, it looks like she's near the water. Mm, that would be all of Florida, wouldn't it? Yeah, a great big area. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is there somewhere in Florida that's not close to the water? <laughs> yeah, Tallahassee's inland. Well, Gainesville. Gainesville. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there's anywhere in Florida that you can't reach one of the coasts within about an hour. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to go east or west and, you know, you're going to run into water, so. And if it's not salt water, it's fresh water because there's so many lakes. Well, that's true, too. Yeah. Yeah, the place is like a big sponge. Get to the swamp. Yep. Or the, yeah, oh. the other guy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to, uh, let's see. Uh, have we got time for that? Let's see. I'm just kind of looking at the time that we've got now. Um, yeah, we're not going to get into steampunk today. Thank you. Um, that would be a little too long. All right, so let's look at uh, this guy right here, um, Edward Munch. All right. Everybody know Edward, right? The guy who did the screen? Yep. Thanks. Yeah. So let's see what he was screaming about. Hello, my name is Paul Queasley. Welcome to Up. For young people and for interested amateurs. 
Today we're going to be looking at the life and work of a great Norwegian artist, Edvard Munch. His work is full of passion and angst. It's wonderful. Edvard Munch was born on the 12th of December 1863 in Lurton in Norway, the son of Dr. Christian Munch and his wife Laura. He had three sisters, Sophie, Laura, Inga, and a brother called Andreas. But family life was very difficult for Edvard because in 1868, at the age of five, his mother died of tuberculosis. As a result, his father sank into deep depression. So Karen, his wife's sister, took over the running and management of the house. The tragedy was compounded when in 1877, Munch's sister Sophie also died of tuberculosis. She was 15 years old. He was just 14. And if that was not enough, his younger sister Laura had mental issues in her teenage years and spent a large part of her life institutionalised in a mental hospital. It is not surprising, therefore, that sickness and death left a permanent mark on Munch's childhood particularly the death of his sister Sophie, whose suffering he later expressed in his painting, The Sick Child. These family issues contributed to Munch's own on-off struggles with mental illness and alcoholism, as well as providing the inspiration for some of his most influential painting. Munch left school at the age of 16 and decided to study engineering. But the following year, he quit his studies after deciding he wanted to become a painter. I want solar panels. Yeah. All the time. And the good news is it's dead wrong. See, lots. I don't think I want solar panels. In early 1881, he began to attend the. Okay. Come on. Hmm. Let's go back a little bit. Steve had decided to study engineering. <clears throat> hmm. A painter. In early 1881, he began to attend the Christiania Drawing Academy and also sold his first two paintings. A couple of years later, he rented a studio in Christiania, now known as Oslo, with six other art students. They were lucky enough to receive support and instruction from the naturalistic painter and illustrator Christian Krog. Initially, Munch's work was heavily influenced by Krog's naturalistic paintings, but Munch exhibited at the Oslo Autumn Exhibition the first time in 1883, and in 1885 showed work at the Antwerp World Exhibition. During this period, he worked on three major paintings, The Day After, Puberty, and The Sick Child. It was also around this time he had his first true relationship with Milo Thalo, the wife of a distant cousin. He was infatuated with her, but she ended the relationship abruptly after two years, leaving him tormented and desolate. Nevertheless, in 1886, Munch showed several paintings, including The Sick Child, at the Oslo Autumn Exhibition, and the public were horrified. It is difficult to understand now why the painting provoked such a violent and angry response when it was first shown. Today, the subject seems conventional, but notice the use of complementary colour, the red of the hair clashing with the greens of the dress. You'll also notice from now on that most of Munch's paintings, he abandons the use of localised colour and uses primary and complementary colours instead, because these colours combinations have a much greater expressive power. What perhaps is more significant is that Monk became increasingly reluctant to paint realistic backgrounds. So his figures seem to be in some sort of indeterminate space. 
This is interesting because it makes us focus much more on the psychology, the thoughts, and the emotions of the figures, and less on their particular situation. Later, in 1889, Munch had his first solo exhibition in Oslo. It was very successful and led to Munch being offered a state grant to study drawing with Leon Bonnard in Paris. But shortly after arriving in France, Munch's father died and his grief pushed him into a deep depression and heavy drinking. So much so he was not able to paint for months. However, in 1890, he moved back to Oslo and painted Spring Day on the Karl Johan Street. This was very much influenced by Seurat's pointillist, neo-impression style. But you'll notice his impatience with Seurat's scientific pointillist approach, as the figures in the middle could not paint it in this style. After a brief spell in Nice convalescing from a bout of rheumatic fever, Monk returned to Paris and took a room at the 49 Rue Lafayette and there in May 1891 he painted another of his impressionist works, Rue Lafayette. Munch later described the work as a brief revival of my impressionist period. It's probably a view from the balcony of Munch's room. In 1892 Munch returned home to Norway and he spent the summer in Astrigard painting. Later that year, at the end of October, he exhibited 55 paintings in Berlin, but was shot by the antagonistic re reception he received from both the public and the press, who couldn't even spell his name right, referring him to, to him as Blunch and not Munch. As a result, the exhibition closed after a week. It was not all bad, because the news of the scandal of the exhibition early, led to the exhibition going on tour to Cologne, Dusseldorf, and surprisingly, it was back in Berlin by the end of the year with a much better reception. For the next year or so, Munch stayed in Berlin. He managed to sell enough paintings to scrape a living whilst working on what would become his most famous series of paintings, The Freeze of Life. The Freeze of Life was a series of paintings which were very much influenced by his own experiences. The paintings explored life, love, death, and would occupy Munch for many years. It was during this year, 1893, he created his most famous painting, The Scream, which is an integral part of his freeze of life. There are over 50 versions of The Scream, paintings and prints, other than the painting that is on display in the National Gallery in Oslo. The screen represents and deals with fear and loneliness of man in the natural setting. In Mock's diary, there is an entry which describes the event on which the painting is based. It reads, I was walking with friends when the sun began to set and suddenly the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned on a fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue dark field and the city. My friends walked on and there I stood, trembling with fear, and I sensed the endless scream. <laughs> During the next couple of years, he continued to work on the freeze of life, completing several important paintings. In this work, The Ashes, we can see the breakdown of a love affair, but the painting also explores the psychology of the moment. The figures appear to be suspended by eloquent gestures, which are different oh, yeah. words, but we understand them perfectly. Another work, Melancholy, explores jealousy, a theme Monk, Munch often studies. In the Bohemian Society of Oslo in the 1890s, free love was often advocated. Polygamous relationships were created, resulting in intense jealousies. This is reflected in the painting. Note the two figures in the background, about to embark on a short trip together to a deserted island, and contrast them with the third figure in the foreground. In the painting, The Deathbed, notice the patient no longer is the focal point of the painting, 
Instead, the focus moves to the hands and the heads of the family at his bedside. They are all linked together in grief by this huge black shadow. It may be significant that Bruce's younger brother, Andreas, died of pneumonia the year before this deathbed painting was produced. These paintings of death form the final part of the freeze of life. The series of paintings was first exhibited under the name The Freeze of Life in Berlin in 1902. But in later shows in Leipzig, Oslo, Prague, Monk included new paintings. In 1898, Munch met the woman who would become his cruel muse. Tula Larsen was the wealthy daughter of one of Oslo's leading wine merchants. From the very start, she pursued him aggressively and their relationship began much against his will. <laughs> My little cousins. Look at me. He fled to Berlin and Paris, but she pursued him. He refused to meet her, but always seemed to give in. In fact, he memorialized the relationship in this painting, The Dance of Life. On the left, we can see the innocent woman in white looking forward to life. In the middle, a sensuous woman dancing with the man, her red dress almost encircling him, and an anguished woman in black on the right. All three resemble Tula Lars, and the girls dancing in the background may also uh, resemble her too. The man in the foreground appears to be Munch. Tula Larson longed to marry Munch, but he once wrote that the touch of her narrow, clammy lips was like the kiss of a corpse. Eventually though, in 1902, after Munch had lost their pre-marriage documents, he escaped to Italy, then Berlin, where despite heavy drinking, he finished the freeze of life. But the saga was not over. After disappearing for a year, Tula Larsen suddenly reappeared, claiming her break from Munch had left her suicidal and depressed. Munch reluctantly agreed to see her, but there was an argument, which somehow resulted in Munch shooting himself. He actually just lost the tip of his finger, which he later described as a monstrosity that everybody stared at. As a result, he never showed his hand in public again, or in painting, always ensuring he wore gloves. A few months after the incident, Tula Larsen married an artist. In 1904, Munch exhibited with the Berlin and Viennese secessions. The following year, he spent the winter in Germany to calm his nerves and combat his drinking. But in the autumn of 1908, Munch collapsed in Copenhagen. He was persuaded to check himself into a private sanatorium on the outskirts of the city because he was hallucinating and was partially paralysed down his left side. After six months in hospital, his drinking reduced and he regained most of his mental stability. He was keen to get back to painting, but he was now alone. The two years life he had led was now behind him, and a new phase of isolation began in his life. As a result, after 1908, a lot of his work doesn't seem to have the same poignancy, drama, and psychological impact as paintings completed before that date. Munch returned to Norway in 1909 and rented a house in Kraugen, where he began work on the murals for the Great Hall of Oslo University, which he completed around 1916. The centerpiece of the installation was the painting, The Sun. It was a massive canvas, more than seven meters wide. The sun is depicted as all persuasive, shining from the heavens on the land and sea, its rays providing all sources of light. Munch was nearly 60 in 1921, when he was commissioned to paint threes of 12 large paintings for the Freer Chocolate Factory in Oslo by the factory's founder, Johan Bronholst. 
The paintings were installed in the women's canteen in 1923. Thrumholst had decided that for the female workers, only the best was good enough. So he got Norway's greatest painter, Munch, to decorate their canteen. With women as the main characters, the paintings depict everyday scenes from the resort towns on Norway's east coast. Munch received the equivalent of 10,000 euros for his work. In 1916, Munch brought a former plant nursery called the Akerley Estate in Skeien on the outskirts of Oslo. He lived at Akerley for the next 28 years until his death. The estate consisted of 11 acres of fields, apple trees, bushes, shrubs, and several large outdoor studios. In 1919, he caught Spanish flu, but survived and commissioned an architect to build him yet another large studio. During its construction, many of the construction workers became subjects of a number of his paintings. During the 1930s, painting became more difficult because Monk contracted an eye disease. So in 1933, on the occasion of his 70th birthday, he was awarded the Grand Cross of the Order of St. Olaf, and three years later saw his first exhibition in England. 1937 saw the Nazis label 82 of Munch's paintings as degenerate and removed them from exhibition in Germany. They were eventually repatriated to Norway, where they were auctioned off. German forces invaded Norway, in 1940, but Munch refused to have anything to do with the occupation forces. Locking himself away at Akerley, he embarked on a number of unflinchingly revealing self-portraits, which explore the theme of an old man facing the prospect of death. In the months before he died, Munch painted self-portrait between the clock and the bed. Ironically, he looks like a man who has held himself back from the dance of life. He appears awkwardly squashed between the grandfather clock and the bed, and looking as though he shouldn't be occupying the space. On the 12th of December, 1943, tributes poured in for his 80th birthday, but he was suffering from a severe cold, which he failed to recover from. Munch died peacefully in his sleep on the 23rd of January, 1944. In his will, he left his entire estate to the city of Oslo. His bequest consisted of 1,150 uh. paintings, 17,000 prints, 4,500 watercolours and drawings and 13 sculptures, as well as writings and literary notes. The collection formed the basis of the Edvard Munch Museum, which opened in 1963 to celebrate the centenary of his birth. Thank you for watching. I hope you've really enjoyed learning about the great Norwegian artist Edvard Munch. If you have enjoyed. Okay. Wonderful. Deep. So, what'd you guys think of that? That was great. I, I can't believe how prolific he was. Yeah, he produced a huge amount of work. Um, and, you know, just his most famous quote unquote painting is not, you know, one painting. You know, as, as he said, he did a, a series of 50 of those. And so, uh, you know, a lot of museums have a version of that either in print or, you know, an oil painting or a pastel. Um, but there, yeah, there are 50 of them out there floating around. So, wow. um, and, you know, we've talked about, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of artists will come up with an idea and, you know, they'll do, a variety of versions of that one particular work, you know, rather than just one. Uh, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll do it over and over and over again until they get it just right. And, uh, 
you know, and that's usually the one that you, you see, you know, uh, publicized. Uh, like, for example, uh, there's an artist by the name of Casey Bow, and a young man, um, excellent draftsman, a uh, good painter as well. But, uh, you know, he, he had a quote in one of the magazines uh, basically saying, you know, that, you know, everybody is excited about his work, you know, but all they see is just like one, one of the pieces, you know, that he did in maybe a series of 15 or 20, you know, he, he maybe did that piece over and over and over again, you know, until he got that one. And that's the one that gets published in the magazine. And, uh, and, you know, it's, it's a misconception, I think, a lot of times that, you know, an artist will just sit down and do like one painting and, you know, start to finish and that that's, you know, that's the finished painting. Um, you know, it's, it's really a not an uncommon practice, you know, to go through a whole series of studies and drawings and a lot of preparatory work and then you get into doing the final work and you may do several versions of it, not just one, until you get something that you're really satisfied with. Yeah. Did he sell those 50 paintings or most of them or? Oh yeah, yeah, he sold all of them. <laughs> and and uh, he, for a good amount of money, he was famous at that point? You mean Monk? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, at that point, yeah, he was, uh, you know, had a, yeah, he was, he was the most, you know, uh, recognized artist, you know, in Norway at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he was, he was very well known all over Europe and, um, you know, even in the United States, you know, by that point, you know, and he, he was actually quite wealthy. Yeah you know, by the standards of that day, um, you know, and, and he made his living, you know, as an artist, you know, that's, that's where he got his money from. So, uh, you know, those commission pieces that he did for the university and then later, you know, other companies and things like that, you know, they paid fairly well. Um, that one huge painting that showed him working on it, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can't even imagine painting something like that. Yeah. You know, yeah, you're, uh, you're so close to it, you, you can't see the... Right. Uh, what's the word? I don't know. The scale of it, yeah. 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 And uh, they were saying that that one painting of the sun was like seven meters long. And if you translate that, that's 21 feet, basically. Jeez. Yeah, in length. So, uh, you know, which by you know, today's standard, and even back then, really wasn't all that large of a painting. You know, um, you know, we've looked at artists like Bo Bartlett, for example, you know, Bo works on paintings that are, you know, 30 or 40 feet long, by wow. 24, 25 feet tall. And just, you know, the scale of those things are, you know, they're enormous. Um, the uh there was a group of painters back in the 60s 70s and 80s uh, that practiced what they call uh field theory painting and um i'm sorry say it again field it's theory called what it's called field theory or field painting okay and um they were abstracts but they were so large that they filled, you know, your peripheral vision, you know, when you were standing in the room with them. So you, you sort of lost a sense of the horizon line and you were actually mm -hmm. sort of in the painting, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so that's why they worked on that scale, you know, was to get that effect. Uh, but, you know, working, working on big pieces, you know, I mean, if you think about it, you know, all the way back to the Renaissance, you know, uh, 
what was the uh, Sistine Chapel other than a really, really large mural that just happened to be on a ceiling rather than on a, on a wall, right? So. I think of these modern, these contemporary mirrors, uh, who make these huge um, outdoor paintings on buildings. I've seen a picture of an artist who was using a crane just to paint. I, I can't imagine how you can uh, visualize that. I mean, how you can imagine it, I guess. I know they work from a plan, but mm -hmm. in executing it, it's, it, it's mind boggling to me. Right. Well, I did, I did a big mural um it was for whole foods it's out in brazelton georgia and it was a 120 foot long wall wow. that was wow. uh, that was 40 feet tall oh my gosh and we covered the whole wall in a in a large landscape uh kind of farm scene and uh and yeah, you use a uh, you use a lift truck, you know that mm -hmm. you know can get you up to the elevation that you want, and then you know you can drive it back and forth, you know, and so you can go from spot to spot with it. Uh, though usually when you get it in a spot, you kind of work that area. But to answer your question, how that works is you do a smaller version. And then you create a grid, right? And then you transfer that grid to the wall surface itself. And then um, just like sign painters, you'll have a, you'll have a little uh, print of your original piece that's been enlarged and you'll cut it up into that square. And while you're painting that square, that's all you're painting. And then you pick up the next square and you connect it, you know, to the bottom and the top and the sides. And that's the only way you can do it because you don't have the luxury of working on something that size and going up and down a ladder to back away from it so you can see it, you know. And on a lift truck, you know, you really can't be much more than about three to four feet away from that wall so that you know you can reach it you know and, and actually work so uh yeah. how long did it take you to do that uh it took about a month yeah yeah i mean you know it took a month to actually do the painting on the wall mm -hmm. okay the planning part uh altogether it was about a six month project wow yeah by the time it, you Pardon? Excuse me. I was wondering what kind of paint do you use? Do you use a uh, house paint? No, or no. We use artist uh, paint. Yeah, we we actually used a. Uh, it was a, a an acrylic enamel paint mm -hmm. uh, that was a uh, artist grade, and uh, it was made for outdoor. And you know, they made it so uh, it had a high enough pigment concentration in it. Uh, and we used colors that were generally considered color fast that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't fade. Uh, because the last thing I wanted to do was be called back there in a couple of years, you know, to go touch it up and, you know, yeah, didn't want to do that. So, How long ago did you do this? 20 years ago now. Have you seen it recently? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I went out there, yeah, I, I went out there maybe about five or six years after I did it, and, uh -huh. and it still looked good. It was fine. Had it faded at all? Uh, maybe just a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, but not by much. I was, it was, yeah, it was still in really pretty good shape. Do you uh, coat it with multiple uh, coats of some kind of lacquer or varnish or something? No, the... Uh, no, no, the the enamel paint that we used mm -hmm. uh, didn't have to be coated because it was actually made for, you know, being on an exterior surface. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
So, yeah, we yeah basically I wanted to use a material that uh, yeah you didn't have to mess with. <laughs> you know, the the less maintenance, the better, right? Did you did you say that uh, it was Whole Foods? Yeah, it was Whole Foods. Did they uh, it, you you got to the point originally? where they approved the, uh, the painting, a small painting? Yeah they, yeah, they approved. Well, you know, we went through kind of this long drawn out process. Mm -hmm. um, they, they put out a call for submissions and, um, you know, people submitted rough, kind of like rough ideas. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, basically took it down, I think to like five or six different artists and then they paid each of them to develop the idea further. And then once, you know, they had all the initial ideas and, and you know, they had a presentation and the board picked, you know, one. And then from there, you know, we took it and developed it further and, and refined it and then did the final piece on cool. the wall. Were those, were those five finalists were the paintings, I mean, uh, like finished paintings? No, they wouldn't be finished paintings. I mean, they were, you know, they were smaller scale. You know, I mean, uh, like the piece that I did was like 30 inches in uh -huh. length, you know. And so it was like, you know, it was a very long kind of narrow, you know, if you, it's, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? It's uh, a one by three uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you scale it out and, you know, you do your concept. Um, and, you know, it was a, you know, it was a good representation of mm -hmm. what I had intended to do. Uh, and, you know, after they approved that, obviously they came back in and there's some things that they wanted to change, you know, and make little tweaks and stuff too. So we made those changes and then, and then we had it scanned and then we added a grid to it digitally. And then we had it all printed out, you know, uh, square by square so that you actually had a card to work with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that when you were doing it again, you, you know, all the cards were numbered. You just pick the right card and, you know, you go up in the lift truck, you know, and you've got all your paint and stuff there and you paint that, that square. So you had a crew then of people, of, of uh, artists? There were only, no, there were only, it was me and one other guy. Wow. Yeah. One other guy who was running the lift? Uh, <laughs> no, we, we could run the lift, you know, oh. separately. But no, there was a guy out, out there assisting me. And, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, the lift had, uh, you know, it had like a little platform that mm -hmm. you could walk on and we'd both be up there um and it was about a six foot run you know from one end to the other and so uh you know you know i'd be painting on one area he'd be painting on the other <laughs> you know? yeah because the idea was you know we didn't have a lot of time and we needed to get it done and uh, mm -hmm. you just needed to cover the wall so very cool had you ever done anything like that before I had never done anything quite that big. That's that's the biggest thing I've ever done. And but you had done real large paintings. Yeah. Well, I I had done murals before. You mm -hmm. know. Um, and in fact, uh, the reason they well the reason I knew them um, is because when they put that warehouse in there, uh, I and um, a guy that they had contracted to do some of the interior finishes. Uh, we had gone in with a spray gun and I had painted the whole ceiling system out uh, as a sky with clouds. Oh. Um, and so, so yeah, they kind of knew how I worked. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So, I have a question. Uh-huh. So, um, somewhere in today's lessons, they were talking about using a grid when you paint. What is your, what is your opinion of grids? 
Uh, well, obviously they're useful. Yeah. Right. And particularly in instances where you're working from a smaller scale piece and you're trying to scale it up to a larger proportion. Um, but that's, you know, also true if you're trying to get an accurate drawing. Right. And um, Susan Jenkins had talked about, yeah. you know, um, well, she, she basically said she did not use a grid. Or, right which was unusual for her because, you know, when she's working, um, you know, trying to do a finished drawing, you know, on the surface uh, to prepare her painting, uh, she usually works with a grid so she can be more accurate. You know. are, there and, are there lessons on YouTube about that, I guess? Using a grid? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there probably is. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that in the drawing classes, uh, we've talked about using a grid before, mm -hmm. um, you know, or creating a grid. Do um, you think we could possibly revisit that at some time? Yeah, we could. Okay. Yeah. And I, want, and I want to be there. Well, um, if, if I did, yeah, and you were interested in it, I would like you to be there, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's not, it's not something that I use a lot, you know, yeah. or that I really advocate. Um, is, it, is it for beginners? No, not specifically. Um, I mean, anybody can use it or use that approach or process. Um, and I guess what I would encourage you to do, if you want to find out about it, Right. is uh, find a find a photo, right? Uh, or some kind of reference that you want to paint. Mm -hmm. And then make a copy of that mm -hmm. on like an eight and a half by 11, you know, uh, piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And then take a canvas, right? Uh, that you want to paint it on and measure the proportions, you know, the length and the width of the canvas, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. then, you know, kind of determine, you know, what that measurement would be and then divide that photo. Like, let's say that you, uh, let's say that you wanted to paint it on an eight by 10 canvas, but your image was only like four inches wide, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you divided that, that photo in, into one half inch blocks, right? Mm -hmm. width -wise, then it would be proportional to the canvas, right? Right. And so if you did a one inch grid on your canvas, it would equal one of those grids, you know, on your image, right? Right. Okay. And so after you have those grids on both your canvas and on your image, and they're proportional to each other, mm -hmm. then you just start transferring, you know, square by square, you know, as to where those things are. All right. I will, I will try to do that. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. And That's like a lot of trouble, but it sounds to me like you're getting a lot of accuracy. Well, and that's why they do it, yeah. is, is that it's a way of checking, you know, um, you know, or trying to be more accurate. Right. right. And so that's why Susan Jenkins uses it, or whatever her name is, because mm -hmm. she likes to be very accurate. Right. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you want to do very tight, very accurate work, uh, and you're working from, you know, a photo or, you know, some kind of image, you know, gritting it off to copy it would be a good way of doing it. Um, some artists will actually take their drawings, you know, their concept drawings and things like that, and make a copy and then grid those off if they want to transfer them and keep sort of that, uh, sort of that directness, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the final piece so that they can, 
you know, more accurately reproduce what they did. So. So it's not paint by number. No, not exactly. You know, it's uh, paint square by square. Paint by square, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, the more complicated and detailed the image that you're starting with, you know, the more you're going to have in that square. Right. Yeah. So. You wouldn't necessarily be painting by square. Wouldn't you be doing the, the uh, illustration, the drawing of it? Depends on how you want to approach it. You know, um, if you're, if you're one of those people that feel like you have to have a drawing okay. underneath, you know, to rely on, um, then you can draw it all out. I don't advocate that. If you're going to paint, just use the paint. You know, why sit, why sit there and draw it all out if you're just going to cover it up with the paint? <laughs> Maybe they're looking for proportion. Yeah, but you can do the same thing with paint stroke too. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, think about it. You know, if you're painting an a la prima paint, right? And let's say you're painting somebody's head. And so you start off with a big brush and you put down some cat orange and maybe, you know, you gradate it, you know, from a lighter area at the top to a slightly darker area at the bottom. And you don't worry about where the face, where the edge of the face is or where the back of the head is. You're just putting down a big block of color, right? And then the way you define that is you come back in with the darker color and you cut in the shape for the front line of the face or the back of the head, right? And then you just keep building, you know, part by part. So, so you can do it either way, but it's like, why, why create more work for yourself yeah. and do this really tight, you know, really accurate drawing. And then you're going to bury it in paint anyway. <laughs> and you'll never, you know, it's not going to be there. You, you know, you're going to lose it. So, so why, why not just do the same thing with a paintbrush and color, you know? And if, if you're afraid of using color at that point, then just do it in value and create yourself an underpainting and then go back in with color over that. That's what I like so much about Ms. Jenkins' thing today. Um, she did the underpaint, underpainting and she talked about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, she... Before she got too chatty. Yeah, well, she kind of did an underpainting, but yeah, it's not really what you would call an underpainting. Um, underpaintings are generally done in, um, in, in monochromatically and in value. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now she was putting down a base layer of acrylic, you know, yeah. and, and I wouldn't really define that as an underpainting. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. So, so the un underpainting is the, um, the gray or the tan yeah. or the whatever. Yeah, it's called either a grisaille, an underpainting, a radachio. Um, you know, there's a lot of different names for it. But basically, it's, it, it's where the artist is solving their value and composition issues. And then from there, all they really have left is to refine the color. So that's kind of the idea. And that's all part of the traditional process of painting or the academic approach, right? You know, if you're, if you're using a contemporary modern approach, then you, you do without that, you know, and you saw it in paint, in color. So anybody got any other, other questions? I have a comment. Yeah, okay. When I was at Tech, I had to do a design for a jacket loom. And we use this it's the same technique talking about, which had little squares. And then we had right. to have a racket. Right, yeah, 
Yeah, so you laid out a grid and then you assign the grid a color or whatever. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, um, is anybody familiar with a, an artist by the name of Chuck? Chuck? Yeah. Chuck Close? There mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you look at his paintings, if you go, you know, get real close to them, and there are these huge canvases, what you'll find is that you'll find a lot of pencil lines that are these little, like, half inch, uh, you know, squares. It's oh, a grid. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he does the same thing. You know, he'll take a photograph of a person's face and he'll have it gridded off and then he'll work square by square. And, but, you know, he's not painting, he's not painting representationally. You know, he's not trying, you know, when you're up close to it, he's not trying to make it look like skin or, or hair or anything else. What he's looking at is he's looking at the color and the value of that square, you know, the average. And he's taking um, a whole series of little colors and he's making these little like swirls or circles or dots, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like a series. So there may be like a thick black outline and then a red inside of that and a yellow inside of that and orange. But when you step back away from it, it all falls together and creates, you know, a color, you know, right. for that one area. And, you know, he connects them all up and optically when it all fuses together, when you're back away from it, it looks like a face. So, really cool. Yeah, that's another one of those optical, you know, approaches to painting. So, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it. So, at any rate, well, it's it's twelve o'clock. It's actually twelve o seven. So, but where are we going tomorrow? Well, I think we're gonna do a. I think we're gonna stick. Uh, with uh, Cascade. Duh. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to send out an email about that. Um, it's, about, it's about a 60% chance of raining tomorrow, they say. Last I checked. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a chance on it. Sound like a winner? Okie doke. Okay, here, let me, let me, um, you know, I haven't looked in the last couple of hours. Let's see, what does the weather say? Oh, okay, it's down to 40. 40% 40 chance tomorrow, okay? And then Friday is supposed to be beautiful and sunny and hot. So, it's supposed to be 91 on Friday. So, uh, so yeah, we'll meet up at Cascade at 10 o'clock. And uh, like I said, I'll be sending out an email uh, right after the class, okay? Is there going to be a backup anytime? Uh, I'm sorry, what? In case of inclement weather. Uh, you mean a cascade? Yeah, it's no. called an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. What, yeah. What's cascade? Uh, it's... It's uh, Cascade Nature Preserve, which is on oh. Cascade Road inside the perimeter in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, I want to say it's what, about 17, 18 acres. Um, it's a fairly large area. Um, it's just native Georgia woodland and streams. There's a, uh, a couple of uh, springs and a waterfall there cool. you know, for you to paint. Um, we, we were out there a couple of months ago and uh, it was the first time I'd ever been out there, you know, to, to really paint. And, um, you know, it, it was a nice day. It's, it's a little bit of walking. It's a little bit further than, you know, most of the places that we go. 
because you, you'll park and then you've got to walk, I would say a half a mile to get to the waterfall. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you go the wrong way and you get lost, you know, you could be meandering out there for six or seven miles. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to have fun. That's not for me. No. Yeah, you, you lost me too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you take some pictures, maybe we'll pay from your pictures. <laughs> okay. We will. Yeah, we will. And, uh, you know, hopefully this time when we go out, um, you know, people would not have had a party or a wedding out there. Um, last time we went and we went to the waterfall, there was all kind of uh, like fruit and stuff floating in the water. Oh, um, I guess they had had some kind of like religious event or something out there. And, you know, part of it is that they put all this fruit in the water. Yeah. So it was kind of a mess last time we went out there but uh it's still kind of a pretty place um it's relatively easy to get to um drive wise um where is it it's called cascade nature preserve but where on cascade road in oh. like the west side of atlanta oh okay okay and uh you know it's not bad so um, later today, also, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Life College. I'm going to go out there and walk around and take the tour. Uh, I've never actually walked around on that campus, so I'm going to go out there and I'm going to look at it, you know, before I finalize the list, because that might be one of the, uh, one of the locations we're going to go paint at. Okay? Will they let, uh, anyone come in there and walk around, like if I wanted to look around in there? Could I go in, or do you have to get permission, or what? Well, I, I talked to somebody who works there, you know, in the administration, and she knows I'm coming out there. I don't think she's notified anybody really that I'm coming. And I think it's kind of open to the public a bit, you know, um, going in and out of the buildings. Yeah, you probably got to get, you know, some kind of permission to do that. But I'm just, there's some, evidently there's some, nature areas and stuff out there and that's where i'm going you know trails and things so i'm just going to go out there and walk around on the trails and take a look since we are a class mm -hmm. do you think that uh state uh managed properties will allow us to come in with no fee since we are senior citizens i'm thinking about sweet water uh the answer is no they won't okay yeah yeah they're um we we had approached uh, the not the Chattahoochee Nature Center, but the it's Chattahoochee National Recreation Area. Uh, they have a ranger station and things up here um, along the river uh, around Roswell, and we had gone out there before and we were trying to get them to not require us to have a parking pass and it just got to be a nightmare oh. so it's just kind of like yeah. it's way 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 too much red tight red tape um you know that's you know that's why i always say you know when i'm looking for a place for the class to go paint i'm looking for three things free parking that's not far away from where we're going to paint, a covered area in case it rains, and a bathroom. Mm. And I always try to find those three if I can. Unfortunately, Cascade only has two of those. So, you know. No bathroom? There's no bathroom. Yeah, uh, there's a bathroom at a Kroger about four miles down the road. Wow. So you got to go get in your car, head off to Kroger, and, you know. <clears throat> but yeah, that's that's the that's the closest accessible bathroom that's at Cascade. So, okay. 
Okay. All right, folks. Well. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you all for coming. And we will see some of you tomorrow. And, uh, and then the rest of you, hopefully, we'll see on Friday. Okay? Either on Zoom or in the classroom. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.